How did the concept of arts and entertainment first make its way into our island? We could attribute it to the British, who introduced drama and theatre to their new colony. But it could also be due to the early immigrants' assimilation of their cultures into the social fabric of Singapore. If our walls could talk, what stories would our buildings tell us? The Victoria Theatre was originally a town hall in the civic district of the city. In memory of the late Queen Victoria, a memorial hall was constructed next to the building in 1901. With the opening of the Victoria Memorial Hall on 18 October 1905, the original town hall building was converted into a theatre. Currently, there are 55 gazetted monuments in Singapore and out of which um, the Victoria Concert Hall is one of them. Victoria Theatre and Memorial Hall has seen many tremendous, important historical events. During World War II, it served as a public hospital of sorts. After the war, the Memorial Hall was used as a crime court for the Japanese war criminals. It also served as a briefing centre for the electorate officials during early Singapore history. The architecture of the Victoria Theatre was modelled closely after similar buildings of the same era in London, and it served as a great example of how the Europeans wasted no time in transporting their architectural style to the new colonies. This building is rather classical in style. It's reflective of the Edwardian architectural style of late 19th century. It has rustificated strips on the plinth, followed by the rusticated bands in the clock tower. The clock tower essentially unifies the two buildings with classical pediments and tetra style facade. The Victoria Theatre quickly became a perfect showcase, not only for international acts, but also numerous local productions. For famed classical Indian dancer Neela Satyalingam, it seemed like just yesterday when she stepped into the theatre for the very first time. When I first saw Victoria Theatre, I was daunted because at that period of time, it was supposed to be the best theatre here. So when you come in and see all this, you think of the Royal Albert Hall. This was so grand compared to all the other small places we used to dance in. And the architecture was so beautiful that we all just came in and watched with great awe because we have never seen something like this. The velvet seats, the velvet curtains. The best of my productions have taken place in Victoria Theatre. So I'm very, very fond of this place. I call this Great Day. It was Bidwell's uh, design that we see today uh, standing as a Victoria Theatre and Concert Hall. He also designed the Teutonic Club, which is currently the Guru Park Hotel. He also designed Raffles Hotel main building, the Singapore Cricket Club across the street here. Everything is so user-friendly and so beautiful because I think as an artist, it's not only the orchestra and the artist, even the people who work in the theatre must know you and you give you the best of their sound and lighting. Even the stage hands have to be very good and they must understand your whole perception of the production. So I think Victoria Theatre is great. Even now I still know all of them who are here because they have worked with me for the last 35 years. What uh, Bidwell have done is that they built this portion in the clock tower before remodeling the town hall as the memorial hall. The clock was only installed one year after the completion of the entire project. Having performed at arts and entertainment venues around the world, how then does Neela compare the Victoria Theatre to its international counterparts? The most important thing that has struck me in Victoria Theatre is the communication between the artist and the audience. There is that eye contact and you feel that the audience is a part of you and you can react to the audience, which I don't find in other places. The audience must be comfortable when they are seated. The sound should be good, the lighting should be good. 
and the temperature inside the auditorium should be comfortable. Backstage also has its facilities, the coming in and going out for artists, quick changes. Whoever has designed this place has thought about those things very well. I think this stage is ideal because it's not too big and not too small. Productions of average size is very successfully done. In front of us is uh, the statue of Sir Stanford Raffles, which was moved here in 1919 from the Padang with the centenary celebration of the founding of Singapore. Over here at the porte cochere of the Memorial Hall, uh, we have the rustification at the plains level followed by a row of mouldings. The moulding feature festoons of tropical fruits and flowers. There are also a lot of insignia with the letters V, R, I, uh, which represent Victoria Regine in Peretz, translated as Victoria Queen and Empress. It served as a reminder that this building is dedicated to Queen Victoria. With the arrival of newer and more sophisticated arts and entertainment venues in Singapore, one question that has invariably been raised is, where does that leave the Victoria Theatre? Will all buildings deteriorate in age of time? To preserve the building, we need to understand the building techniques of the past in order to do a sensible repairs or restoration to the building. Personally, I believe that the building certainly have a place in Singapore history and will continue for 100 years to come to serve the art scene. If the structure of the building is strong enough, I think it can go on forever. Because in other countries, I have seen the performing areas there for quite, quite some time. A hundred years after it opened its doors to welcome its first patron, the Victoria Theatre remains especially popular among small performing groups who are appreciative of the intimate yet elegant space the theatre offers. But in the 1960s, as the art scene grew rapidly and audience size increased significantly, there was a need for a venue of a larger scale, a venue which would also mark the new era for Singapore's self-government. The Victoria Theatre and Concert Hall lived up to world-class standards and provided the best acoustics of any venue in the city. However, the new Singapore government felt the need for a large venue to host larger international performances, which would become a focal point of nationalistic pride and achievement. The winner of a national competition launched by the government to design and build the National Theatre was the local architect, Alfred Wong. In 1958, we have uh, self-government. And then there was merger. And then there was separation. Singapore really lived through a very eventful time. And suddenly you have this request to build the National Theatre. I think at that time, the government wanted to present the culture as something which belongs to the people, which is not tied to a a somewhat colonial symbol. The National Theatre quickly became the venue of choice for international performances, university convocations, and even National Day rallies. Musician and conductor Paul Abishaganadan, who is a recipient of the Cultural Medallion, organised the first cultural festival, which appropriately took place at the National Theatre. I was a, a member of the National Theatre Trust. Uh, this trust had been created in order to oversee the building and the activities of the National Theatre when, when it was completed. Our job was really to help with all the artistic requirements of the first ever cultural festival which was held here in Singapore. Our festival had a spirit which was different. Singapore was celebrating the sensation of freedom. Never before did we have Indian, Chinese, Malay and Western performers together on stage. So we needed a theatre which could house all these performers. The National Theatre was jointly funded by the government and the public through a unique A Dollar a Brick campaign. In those days, it was supposed to cater for the men in the street. For that reason, the fundraising was they make little card that is the shape of a brick, you know. And it's one dollar per card, one dollar per brick to help to build the National Theatre. That gives me an idea when we were actually designing it. We actually had a brick kiln in Singapore. 
So when I built the theater, I had the bricks in between these diamond shaped frames. They are what we call fair face bricks. The bricks are revealed. It was wonderful how so many people donated towards the theater because the theater was a sort of symbol of national unity. This was the first time that a theater had been purpose built to be able to hold large scale performances of music and dance. Built at a cost of about $4 million and featuring a seating capacity of 3,420, the five-pointed facade of the National Theatre, which represented the five stars of the Singapore flag, immediately captured the fancy of the public. If I used the usual construction, it would look like either a factory or a block of flats. It should be a building which is different from other buildings around. Designing a building is more than just a functional requirement. You have to give an architectural statement of what it is. Since this is a people's theatre, a national theatre, it has to be something different. The facade was something that was quite unique to everybody at that time. It was completely accessible. There were no lifts to take and no steps to climb, and you just walked in. It was a struggle all the way to find financing, and the Theatre Trust has to work extremely hard. My job was to identify right, the essential things which this theatre would need in order to function. The theatre has a whole lot of things inside including a 75 feet rotating stage. The stage had to be large enough to, to allow a revolving stage so that we could prepare uh, something behind the curtain which could be revolved around immediately to save time. This was the first time that we had a theatre that had all these amenities. The location is at the corner of River Valley Road and Tank Road. The first the task that I had was to try and orientate the theatre so that the back of the theatre would face the traffic, would face the corner. The back part, therefore, is shielded from the worst of the traffic passing. The cover was considered to be a great uh, engineering feat. It was a huge cantilever roof. The roof will cover the seating, provided the rain comes straight down. Sideways, rain, there was no way of stopping it. There just wasn't enough budget to do a big enough roof. And every time there's sideways rain, there's a vast amount of complaints and say, I got wet because, you know, I was on the side roof. The magic of the National Theatre did not last long, however. The proposal of an underground expressway tunnel close to the theatre, coupled with declining use of the venue, brought an end to the national icon. We had a meeting with uh, the LTA officials and they say two bays of this theatre would have to come down. Of course, it can be rebuilt after they dug the tunnel. Costs have risen so much that the replacement cost of the two bays exceeded the cost of building the National Theatre itself. After staging its last performance on 15 January 1984, the National Theatre closed for demolition. There was a lot of opposition to the demolition. They say that there are defects in the theatre. I would not agree. There was so much enthusiasm in people building the theatre of doing their best for the theatre that I believe the structure is sound. And it was confirmed by the fact that when we got consultants from UK to come and check through the structure, they say that the structure is OK, it just requires regular maintenance. We understood the reasons why uh, there was no longer the need for this kind of a a uh, meeting place called the National Theatre. Uh, and true to its, its title, true to its name, it was a national theatre. It was built for national purposes and not so much for music or dance purposes. Today, all that remains of the National Theatre is a pair of heritage markers standing in its original site. The theatre was a symbol of nationalistic unity and strength, and its closure also brought an end to an era where the people shared a strong communal bond with a public building and monument. The loss of the National Theatre left a void. The challenge was to build a state-of-the-art performance venue of iconic appearance and striking proportions.
More than a decade after the National Theatre was demolished, a new arts performance venue was to make its debut. In 1993, local firm DP Architects jointly won the competition with British architect Michael Wilford to design the new art centre. One thing that differentiated this uh, entry from the others uh, was that all the other entries primarily addressed the waterfront effectively ignored the city centre and I think that may have been one of the compelling reasons why this design won. After Wilford left the project in 1995, DP Architects soldiered on with the challenge of building an arts and entertainment centre that would defy all previous conceptions of what an arts performance venue should embody. A good building for the arts today is not an easy building to do. It has to address a lot of divergent needs. Society is polarized in its desires and aspirations a lot more than it used to be. The local context is a nation city that's aspiring to be a world city. And we're also building in a climate that's very hot with almost on the equator. So we designed for that context. The design of the Esplanade used a large amount of glass in order to allow as much natural light as possible into the building. The clients wanted this performing arts centre to be a people's performing arts centre, something that wasn't a mystery to the general public. So we wanted a lot of transparency into the building. And the way to do that is to use a lot of glass. But of course that goes completely against the fact that we have a lot of sun bearing down on us. So we knew that we would have to have some kind of sun shading as part of the design. We were able to exploit the three-dimensional modeling possibilities of our CAD software and we found that this system of sun shading offered a lot of potential which allowed us to lay out the sun shading in a much more natural, flowing and organic manner which had a lot of echoes in traditional arts and crafts in Southeast Asia and also gave us that iconic look that everybody was looking for. Encompassing a theatre, concert hall, recital studio, black box theatre, as well as several outdoor performance spaces in a single location. The building also includes a shopping mall and a number of restaurants. Well, if you look at performing arts centres around the world, when there's no performance going on, they're dead. So one of the things that came into the brief very early was to design some kind of outlets that would be used throughout the day. Even when there's no performance going on, the building doesn't feel dead. One of the artists to get a feel of performing at the Esplanade is local electro rock chanteuse Mei Wong, better known as the Analog Girl. The Esplanade, as you can see, is made up of um, geometric shapes. You don't really quite know what it's supposed to stand for or mean, and that is the beauty of the architecture of the Esplanade because it's abstraction and it's very artistic and you can interpret it in any form that you want. So that's really inspiring. The Esplanade Theatres on the Bay opened in 2002 to an equal amount of praise and brick bats. While admirers lauded the theatre for retaining an Asian flavour amid its futuristic structure, its detractors liken its spiked exterior to the local fruit, durians. When people look at it, they often say, were you inspired by a durian or a fly's eyes or a microphone? The truth is, it's all in the eye of the beholder. The design that was initially derided as a durian has become popular. The Analog Girl's unique brand of laptop rock and widespread critical acclaim have brought her to performing venues in London, Paris, New York and Shanghai. So how does the experience of performing her kind of music at the Esplanade compare to her international gigs? The Esplanade itself is situated at the bay and that to me brings a whole sense of magic and wonderment because you know you see the reflection in the water and that's really inspiring and um, artistic as well and very organic. The performing arts scene in Singapore un until I'd say the 80s or 90s was not a very big scene, you know, but things have changed a lot. Today, the scene here is very vibrant and I think the Esplanade has been an integral part of that transformation in the last uh, decade or so. 
Right now, we are near the concourse area of the Esplanade and that's where I performed in 2008 for Baby's Music Indie Festival. So it's a really nice and free open space which is really cool because you get all sorts of people checking out your music. The acoustics really drive a lot of what goes on in the Esplanade architecturally. The concert hall is an acoustic gem. Ministry of Information and the Arts first chose the acoustician before even choosing the architect. And they chose one of the world's best, Artec or Russell Johnson. Uh, Russell Johnson was asked uh, when the project finished whether uh, this was the best in the world. And ever the diplomatic gentleman, he said, well, it's one of the five best in the world. The concert hall at the Esplanade, I believe, was built for the Singapore Symphonic Orchestra and it's got really good acoustics and it looks really, really grand. But at the same time, its use of space is pretty unconventional as well, where you hold like, you know, electronic performances from Kraftwerk and indie rock concerts uh, from like Death Cat for Cutie. So that's a really, you know, nice use of space. Is this Esplanade forever? I don't know. Uh, forever is a long time. But we took our best shot and I think that we've come up with a really good building uh, that addresses the needs of a contemporary city in Asia. The Esplanade might be viewed by many as a success and an object of national pride, but it took the lessons learned from the buildings of our past to arrive at where it is today. The controversy generated by its design process and glass-heavy facade brings to attention a few issues which might be of great relevance to the future development of Singapore's architectural scene. Listen to Our Wars is a six-part series that showcases the evolution of Singapore architecture from pre-colonial days to the modern era. Not only that buildings are shelter for people, but more interestingly, it is people who makes the building memorable. My belief is that we need to design buildings based on good fundamentals such as environmental sustainability, climatic sensitivity, and most importantly, go back to listen to the people and make sure that our building reflects their social and cultural aspirations. In this way, then we can make buildings lasting. What if buildings continue to face the challenge of being taken down such as a block sale, should architects continue to design buildings that are lasting and memorable? It is my belief that architects must continue to design great buildings to inspire the people who live in there. In that way, buildings can then be meaningful to people and the society.